Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for another one of our webinars. Uh, we got a great one today for you, Feeling the Pressure. Uh, we're gonna talk about some pressure regulation today. By the way, my name is Greg Rosink. I'm the Product Training Specialist here at Hunter Industries. And before I get into who's presenting today and some of the topics that we're gonna talk about, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted after the live event today. We are monitoring questions as they come in. So if you do have a question or even just a comment about something that we're talking about during the presentation, use the drop down questions box on your go to webinar control panel and those will come straight to me and I will filter through them and as we get good questions coming in, we can possibly pause and answer them then, or we'll address them in the Q&A section. So with that being said, if you haven't done so already, we want you to go by and check out our current promotion at revitup.hunterindustries.com. During this promotion, there's an opportunity to earn coins that can be redeemed for hunter swag, hunter apparel, even be risked in monthly drawings for big item prizes. So check it out. All you have to do is answer a couple questions a week. And there's also other opportunities to earn coins through MyList, uh, through FX Luminaire and Hunter MyList. And if you haven't done so already, which I'm sure and hopefully you have, visit Hunter University. It's our online training site with a ton of free content. It's free to create an account. It's free to learn. Training.hunterindustries.com. A lot of good information there, so please stop by. And where this will be hosted? After the presentation on YouTube, our Hunter Industries YouTube channel. If you visit there, there's a ton of information about our products and some industry practices that'll help you with your business, hopefully. And also while you're there, click the subscribe button, and then just above it, click the little bell so that you get notifications when new stuff posts, like this presentation. You'll also be able to take a quick quiz on this presentation on our training site, which will give you a certificate for completion so you can actually download that or you can save it to your files. Now, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Now, Kelsey Jacquard is a product manager for, um, she's a senior product manager here at Hunter for a lot of our mechanical products. She's got a lot of industry experience. She's got an engineering mind. She's gonna share some information with you today about pressure regulation, how to spec it in your systems, how to use it in your systems, and what to look out for when you are using pressure regulation. Chris Rosink, he's the Southern California Specification Manager for Hunter Industries. So it's the San Diego County, uh, Riverside County areas. He's went to San Diego State, has, many years of experience. He's been with Hunter for 18 years. And before that, he owned his own landscape maintenance company where he did a lot of irrigation uh, type installation and construction as well. Now, he works on the Quell program, which I'd like to mention that there is a lot of CEU opportunities on the training site. And the Quell program is a certification program that helps you become a certified auditor in the California area. So if you were looking for that and you're from California, check it out. Uh, we also have Julie Ziegler. She is the spec manager for Florida, and she has many years of industry experience. She knows a lot about pressure regulation, so she's great to have on the call today, but it doesn't end there. She's got a lot of specification experience, so if you have any questions and you're in the Florida area, please reach out to, to Julie. She's a wealth of information, and she can definitely help you out. Now, with that being said, Kelsey, Hopefully your introductions were uh, satisfactory and I'll let you take it away. Always. Good job, Greg. Thank you. There's been a lot of talk lately on pressure regulation, especially as several states have started mandating the use of pressure regulated spray sprinklers. While regulating pressure at the heads is one option for managing pressure, there are also other pressure regulating devices available. And to be clear, when we refer to pressure regulation, we mean regulated dynamic pressure. That's the pressure when the system is on and the water is flowing. Sometimes irrigation systems have too little pressure and sometimes systems have too much pressure. It's often assumed that too much pressure is a good thing, 
where the irrigation possibilities are endless and all devices are guaranteed to work wonderfully. We hear that called good pressure all the time. While it is easier to regulate pressure down instead of boosting it up, too high of pressure can cause structural and functional problems on a system. And we should therefore be managing uh, that pressure through various means of pressure regulation. There is also a significant amount of water savings associated with pressure regulation. So our topics for this discussion include first and foremost, what is pressure regulation? What is a pressure regulator? We will then go into the general benefits of pressure regulation, followed by different types of pressure regulators and how they work. Lastly, we'll discuss how and when to use pressure regulation, including the new state rules on pressure regulated pop-ups. So what is a pressure regulator? A pressure regulator is a device that reduces the input pressure, whether constant or variable, to a set constant output pressure. These devices typically use a spring force to control the pressure drop across the device and thereby control the output pressure. The strength of the spring is designed for the desired out output pressure value. And we'll go into exactly how some of them work in a bit, but this is the general idea. Pressure regulation is the control of the downstream pressure using a pressure regulation device. One thing I want to clarify, uh, I sometimes hear the terms pressure regulation and pressure compensation used interchangeably, and that is incorrect. These are two different methods of pressure management that have two different effects on the system. As we've mentioned, spring stiffness controls the pressure output from a pressure regulator. Emission devices are then installed after the pressure regulator, so they see the same pressure always. The constant output pressure from the regulator maintains a constant flow rate from the emission device. In pressure compensation devices, a small flexible cylinder controls the flow rate through the emission device, as seen right here in yellow. For example, the pressure compensating bubbler, which is shown here on this slide, has a flexible cylinder assembled along the flow path. As the pressure builds up underneath the cylinder, the orifice flexes and it chokes down the size of that flow path, limiting the amount of flow through that cylinder. It's a simple way to maintain a relatively constant flow rate through the device. Sometimes pressure compensating bubbler nozzles are installed on pressure regulating sprinkler heads for ultimate flow consistency. Uh, but in general, pressure regulators maintain a constant output pressure, while pressure compensators maintain a constant output flow rate regardless of that input pressure. So why use a pressure regulator and what's its purpose? Pressure regulators increase the lifespan of an irrigation system. High pressures put more stress on pipe, on fittings, and on emission devices, and pressure spikes are especially devastating. Pressure regulation can prevent damage from pressure surges or just the wear and tear of high pressure in general. Additionally, some products don't function properly or at all at high pressure. Check the specs during the design because products like emitters and even pressure compensating bubblers will eventually flow too little at high pressure because that flexible orifice will choke too much or it can even close up completely. The next reason for pressure regulation is to improve the water efficiency of the system. Most emission devices have an optimal pressure that maximizes their performance. For overhead irrigation products like rotors and sprays, the optimal pressure maximizes the uniformity from the nozzle, which then reduces the required run times for good water coverage. For drip products, the optimal pressure range maximizes the uniformity across the emitters. Applying this optimal pressure to an irrigation device or to a zone reduces excessive flow rates, reduces misting and poor coverage from overhead devices, and it increases uniformity across the zone. So let's take a look at pressure regulated and non-pressure regulated systems side by side. We can see the water savings pretty quickly when we do the math. In this example with spray nozzles, zone A is regulated and zone B is not. To keep the math simple, we set both zones to have 10 heads with 15 foot half nozzles. The pressure for zone A is the spray nozzles optimal 30 PSI, 
while zone B is higher at a more typical 50 PSI. The gallons per minute per nozzle is based on that pressure. So zone A nozzles each emit about 1.9 gallons per minute, and zone B nozzles each, amount, each, each emit about 2.7 gallons per minute. With a 10 minute runtime with 10 heads, the gallons used per cycle is 190 gallons for zone A and 270 gallons for zone B. Right off the bat, we have an extra 80 gallons used per cycle. Assuming 120 cycles per year, the total gallons used for zone A throughout the year is 22,800 gallons, while zone B uses 32,400 gallons. Not only is that about a 30% water savings in reduced flow rates, but it comes out to almost 10,000 gallons saved for one zone over the course of a year. That's a lot of water. And keep in mind, many systems, even spray systems, run at pressures higher than 50 PSI. I've been on sites with brand new spray systems running at 70 PSI, and the installer is thrilled to see water misting everywhere. It means they have that good pressure we were talking about. We're just used to seeing systems uh, mist. Uh, that's why we call spray heads mist heads in some parts of the country, but it's not correct. High pressure turns the spray into a fine mist that just floats away in the wind, away from the target landscape and onto some nearby hardscape or cars and buildings. Providing the optimal pressure for an overhead system will help maintain large water droplets, higher uniformity, and the correct flow rate for the zone. This is why some states are starting to mandate pressure regulation for spray sprinklers. Sorry, sorry. Having some technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Along with the improved flow rates and improved uniformity from the nozzle, pressure regulation at each head ensures that each nozzle seems the, sees the same pressure and therefore provides the same performance. This is especially true for long runs. With pressure regulated heads, you can avoid having more pressure at the first head and less and less pressure as you move down the line. Each nozzle sees the same pressure with pressure regulation. This maintains the same performance across the entire zone. That is of course dependent on having enough dynamic pressure from the start, and we'll get into that later on in the presentation. So now that we all love pressure regulation, what kinds of regulation devices can we use on our designs? And Julie's gonna explain some of those for us. Hi, and thank you. Um, so with um, the common pressure regulators, as you can see, there are some of the common pressure regulators that we see um, on irrigation systems, starting with the main line. Oh, sorry, let me see if, sorry about that. Is it working no now? Yep, we see it. All right, so, good. sorry. So common pressure regulator, oops, there we go, back again. Mainline pressure regulators, valve pressure regulators, drip zone, kits for micro irrigation, and pressure regulated sprinklers. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having this cold over here as well. So, uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Mainline pressure regulators. So um, at this point, the, the pressure of the property can be regulated at the point of connection um, with a mainline pressure regulator. These often regulate the pressure to the house, to the irrigation system. Many are adjustable to, adjustable to better fit different types of properties too. Mid, um, for this particular example, shows the pressure regulator placed after the backflow. The next option is regulated at the valve. So the, there are two ways to regulate pressure at the valve using either an add-on device like the Hunter AccuSync or a drip zone kit. Here we see the AccuSync installed where the solenoid connects to the valve. The AccuSync comes in both a 30 and 40 PSI thick pressure option or an adjustable option with a range from 20 to 100 PSI. These basically work like an automatic flow control knob. 
the flow control on a valve limits the stroke of the diaphragm in the valve based on the pressure it sees initially during the setup. You should Tune the flow control if the valve is taking too long to close or if you see a lot of misting from the head. The benefit of the AccuSync is that it also limits the opening of the diaphragm by controlling the water above the diaphragm in the valve bonnet, but it can adjust itself based on incoming pressure to maintain constant output pressure after the valve. So even if the input pressure changes or fluctuates, the AccuSync will maintain a constant output pressure. The other valve pressure regulate, regulator is a drip zone kit. So here we have the micro irrigation um, drip zone kit. The more traditional and more common valve regulator is the drip zone kit. These kits include a valve and pressure regulator designed for drip or micro system and a filter to prevent debris from entering the micro irrigation zone. Models range from smaller, more residential drip zone kits to big, high-flowing kits for large commercial properties. For overhead irrigation, you can regulate pressure at the spray head or the rotor. Regulating at the head for overhead irrigation allows for a nicely balanced line with optimal uniformity and performance for each nozzle. So you see higher uniformity, minimal misting, and lower flow rates. For sprays and rotary nozzles, there are pressure-regulated shrub adapters and spray bodies that regulate incoming pressure up to 100 PSI down to more optimal 30 and 40 PSI. Look for the EPA Waterson symbol for certified pressure-regulated spray sprinklers. Some states are mandating the use of EPA Waterson certified spray sprinklers within the next year. We will discuss the details later in this presentation. Like we mentioned, pressure-regulated three-quarter inch rotors are also available to maintain constant optimal performance for each rotor nozzle. Again, it will provide higher uniformity, minimal misting, and lower flow rates. These rotors reduce incoming pressure up to 100 PSI to an optimal 45 PSI for the nozzle. They are designed with a blue band on the top of the rotor. So that's important to see if you're out in the field and you're looking for pressure-regulated uh, rotors, look for that blue band that would indicate it's pressure regulated. So pressure regulation at the head to higher uniformity, minimal misting, and lower flow rates from the nozzle. There is also now a pressure regulated adapter that fits under any three quarter inch rotor as well as a new pressure regulated shrub rotor. Both also regulate pressure to 45 PSI. Chris, do you have an example of using these pressure regulated rotors on slopes in California? Yeah, California has a lot of topography and you know a lot of residential development systems are cut and graded and you need to uh, as, you know water water large slopes. And so as you go and change in elevation, if let's say your point of connection is above your irrigation zone, then you might gain pressure as you go down. So having the top middle and bottom of the slope all have the same pressure is a great thing. And these pressure regulated rotors allow you to do that. The PR075 is an adapter that can be added to any 12 inch high pop rotor, whether it's an I-2012 or a PGP-12 under the bottom of the rotor, and or can be added to any shrub rotor that you may already have out there if you just want to add pressure regulation. And this is something we see common in freeway work if you look at caltrans and, and and the pressures they have on the side of the freeway very very long runs of, of irrigation nice to be able to put a little regulator at the bottom of each head and, and ensure you're getting the optimal efficiency out of each nozzle and of course we we manufacture our shrub rotors with it with the pgp00 prb or the i20 prb so let's take a look at how a pressure regulator works so here we have a pressure regulator from a common drip zone kit. Uh, and this is a mechanical pressure regulator. Let's take a look under the hood here. And what we see with uh, this regulator, this is a Seniger regulator. And Seniger uh, is, was acquired back in 2016 by Hunter Industries. And Seniger is the world leader in agriculture and, uh, and landscape irrigation pressure regulation. So very happy to have that in our catalog. 
Um, and let, let's take a look at how, how one of these would work. So you see the, the left-hand side, you got the black inlet of where the, where the water comes in, and then it goes out the right side, which is gonna be the, the white uh, part of the regulator. So water's gonna flow through the inlet, and you'll see the little Y-shaped seat there. It flows around that seat, and it goes through a little tube called a throttling stem. Around that throttling stem, there is a spring, and that spring is pushing back on a diaphragm, which is on the far right side. So the, the, the throttling stem is like a tapered uh, straw going through a balloon, so to speak. And so as the water back pressures and fills up the system, the back pressure on that diaphragm on the right side will push that throttle back and then restrict the opening on the left hand side and you can see the ex the expanded view of the opening as it's been pushed that throttle has been pushed back it's basically working like a gate valve and limiting the amount of flow that's going through uh, as the flux as the pressure fluctuates in the system so let's take a look at an animation of this see if we can get that up for you Okay, so in this clip, you'll see the Sinegar 10 pound pressure regulator. And you'll see the inlet pressure in the bottom right of the screen. It's gonna play a few times, just so you can see. But the inlet pressure is 60 PSI, and the outlet pressure will start at 60 PSI as the system spools up, and then it will gradually go down to 40 PSI. So let's take a look at the water flowing in from the bottom, going through the flow throttle. You'll see the water fill up the top of the chamber. When it fills up the top of the chamber, uh, right above the red area there, you'll see that it pushes down on the black diaphragm and pushes against the spring. So if we want to advance the, now you'll see, so you'll see that it actually closes the flow throttle. So if we do it one more time, look at now, look at the bottom where the flow throttle closes against the, uh, the incoming port. So basically it just works like a gate valve. It's constantly out there regulating as you as your system uh, flows. And so your incoming pressure would be 60. And in this particular case, because this is a 10 PSI regulator, it would regulate your outgoing downstream to the lateral to 10 PSI. And it would hold it at 10 PSI the entire time the system's running. So now let's take a look at, uh, at this next uh, chart here. It's important to know what regulator you're using and if you need a regulator, okay? Because a lot of designers I speak with uh, will, will default to a catalog uh, drip zone kit, which is nice because they're pre-manufactured uh, and they you know can save a lot of time, but you may find that you don't need a regulator. So typical drip zone irrigation is usually less than about 50 PSI. So if your incoming pressure, and you know your incoming dynamic pressure is less than 50, you may not need a regulator in the first place. So don't let that confuse you. You may just need a filter Y strainer. So in this case, let's take a look at this chart uh, and, and figure out what drip zone kit we need to have. We have an ICZ40, which is a standard drip zone kit, and an ICZ LF40 here. So if we look at our chart, and let's say we have 10 gallon a minute flow rate. So Kelsey, can you point to 10 gallons a minute on the chart here? Okay, so we have our, we have our 10 gallon a minute uh, incoming flow and we wanted to use a, let's say we wanna use a 40 PSI regulator. If you look at the chart for the, uh, the regulator, we would need to have 52 PSI coming in for our low flow drip zone kit. So if we look at our chart, we'll see what our incoming pressure is and what our downstream pressure re would regulate to. What we are looking for is the right size regulator for our system. So if we have a small drip zone that you know, may just be a, a really small little area, we could, we could choose to use a, a 25 PSI regulator. Uh, and if we have a larger zone, maybe we want a 40 PSI regulator. But we always wanna go back and validate with the chart that, that we have the appropriate incoming pressure for that particular regulator we're using. So Kelsey, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit more how the pressure regulator would work and the differential required in, in a pressure regulator? 
Um, sure. So I was going to go into how the uh, the pressure regulators work in the rotors and sprays, <laughs> and then we'll go into the pressure differential for all of the products afterwards. Um, so the rotor and spray pressure regulators work really similarly to the drip zone kit regulators, uh, but they do look a little simpler too, which is kind of nice for my explanation. Um, so as water flows through the regulator, there is a back pressure created by the nozzle that presses down on the piston of the regulator. So the piston closes the opening and the spring tries to keep it open. So you end up with this balance of force uh, trying to determine what this particular opening area will be right here uh, based on your input pressure and then therefore your back pressure. So once that upward force of the spring equalizes with the downward force of the piston, you have that regulated outlet pressure. Uh, the regulator will maintain a constant pressure if the inlet pressure should change or if the nozzle should change. And that's the beauty of pressure regulation. The pressure regulator in a PRS spray body is basically the same as in the rotor. So it looks very similar and you can see it here on the right side. The back pressure, same as with the rotor, balances with the regulator spring to create that desired outlet pressure. Uh, there is a pressure differential, like Chris mentioned, required for both spray bodies and the rotors. So a pressure differential of about 10 PSI is required to initiate that movement of the pressure regulator. The regulator assembly is made up of the spring, that moving orifice area, and generally an O-ring or a diaphragm that seals between the moving pieces and the static riser. Overcoming that friction of the regulator assembly to get it to regulate is what requires that extra 10 PSI. The actual pressure loss is minimal, uh, but that extra pressure is necessary as a boost to push that regulator into place. If you only have 35 PSI coming into a Pro Spray PRS40 head, the outlet pressure will be closer to about 33 PSI. The pressure loss is less than you would with a drip zone kit, uh, but you won't get that, uh, that desired 40 PSI. This, it's not a booster pump. If you come in with 35 PSI, you're going to end up with just under that 35 PSI. It's not going to magically bring you up to 40 PSI. And you'd be surprised at how often we actually do get that question. Um, for good design practice, if you can, have that extra 10 PSI minimum of dynamic pressure at the heads to ensure proper system operation. If you can have it, a little buffer is a good thing. So I hope we're a little bit more comfortable in understanding how the pressure regulators work. Uh, and Chris is gonna go into how and when to use them. Thanks, Kelsey. So let's take a look at a traditional landscape design. And the dynamic pressure at each of a zone uh, for an, like an overhead irrigation system should be tailored to the optimal pressure for the sprinkler device. So in this particular case, we have a residence that has some irrigation uh, on all sides of the land, on all sides of the, the property. Uh, but let's say the meter is at the front of the property and we're going to the back of the property. We need to know what our static pressure is at our meter. And that's often all we get is the available static pressure uh, from our, our point of connection. But we need to know the areas that we're going to intend to irrigate. You see areas A through D. And what we're going, what type of uh, plant material we're going to irrigate and what the zone areas might represent. And then what irrigation devices we might want to use in those areas. So we may have three different types of pressure regulation on our zone. Let's say our incoming pressure is uh, 80 PSI from our city main line, and that's typical in California. Uh, it may not be everywhere, but if our pressure is high coming in, we may have a pressure regulator at our point of connection or right after our water meter. Uh, then we will have a, uh, a regulator maybe for our pop-up sprinkler heads around our spray zone areas on the sides of the home. And then on the back, we know we've got uh, rotors and we may have, uh, we only need 45 at our rotors. And by the time you get to the backyard, we got 60 at the head with the pressure loss to the backyard. 
So we probably should put in a pressure regulated rotor for our, our rotor areas uh, in the backyard. And then you see in the far right, we've got our drip zone system. So our drip zone system, while it has 80 PSI coming in, uh, we could have regulated down to 70 PSI or 60 PSI, but we still need to get that down into the range of drip, which we said was somewhat under 50 PSI. So let's put in a drip zone kit to regulate our uh, drip irrigation on the back. So note the type of product that you're using and the optimal efficiency that each device runs at, and then specify your regulation, your pressure regulation based on your pressure loss through your system, where you need it and where you see appropriate it based on your calculations. So that gets us from static pressure to our dynamic pressure at the head. Can we advance the slide, Kelsey? Great. Now, this is a micro irrigation system, and in certain regions, you may do inline valves and want an inline drip zone kit. And in parts of California, you may use anti siphon valves on residential. And we have drip zone kits for both. Uh, the question is should I use a 25 psi or a 40 psi option? And a lot of folks say, well, if I can get extra pressure and I'm under 50, why not take the extra pressure? But you do need to go back to the chart and determine based on your, uh, your incoming pressure what the ideal regulator might be for your system. And again, if you have a zone with long runs of, of drip tubing uh, and your, you know, your, your flows are higher, you may want a higher pressure, uh, higher regulating pressure regulator to 40 PSI instead of 25 PSI but just go through and double check that the incoming pressure is going to operate that regulator at what you need. And again, if you don't need a regulator, you may only need the Y strainer filter and not need a pressure regulator. So let's take a look at a drip zone system or a micro irrigation system as we call it. And here we have in the left-hand side, we've got our pressure regulator. And in this layout, you'll see the header and the line going out, we need to make sure that that regulator is going to make to give our worst case emitter, the furthest emitter, or maybe the highest emitter in the system, adequate pressure to flow that emitter. And we also wanna know as a backup, just as, to prevent any fluctuations in the system, that if we did have incoming pressure fluctuation, that we wouldn't be blowing out uh, you know, hoses, popping off you know, fittings, or doing damage to our system should our incoming pressure fluctuate. And so we would put in a uh, drip zone kit, or we could specify a variety of combinations of Hunter Y strainer filters, as well as pressure regulators. So if this was a commercial application and we wanted to customize this with a brass valve, we could go to the Hunter catalog volume 38 and look at the wide variety of Sinegar pressure regulators that are in the catalog. And I could say have a two inch IBV brass valve with a two inch Y strainer, HY201, and a high range Sinegar pressure regulator. And I can customize a system. Just because we don't have a pre-manufactured drip zone kit doesn't mean you can't order off the menu and specify your own. So wanted to make that point. And uh, I think Kelsey, we are back over to you. Sounds good. Moving on over to overhead. All right, overhead irrigation systems um, often go without any type of pressure regulation, unlike micro systems, uh, since there is less risk for catastrophic product failure with the higher pressures. However, the efficiency of the emission devices is greatly determined by that dynamic pressure. So flow rates, uniformity, and the potential for misting all depend on that incoming pressure. Spray nozzles are happiest at 30 PSI. This is their recommended dynamic pressure for minimal misting. Um, and high efficiency MP rotator nozzles perform best at 40 PSI, but they also do function at the lower 30 PSI as well. You just get a shorter radius as shown in the catalog specs. MP rotators in general are less susceptible to misting and low DU, but if we do wanna maximize their performance, we should run them at their optimal pressure. 
And lastly, mid-sized rotors prefer a 45 PSI dynamic pressure, where larger rotors can need up to 60 to 80 PSI. Just be sure to check the specs in the catalog for the optimal pressure for any of the products that you choose to install. Optimal flow rates for large water droplets in an even pattern not only improve the water efficiency of a project, but uh, they honestly, they help make the industry look better. Even now, living in Southern California, many of my neighbors have sprays misting all over the sidewalk, um, on short pop-ups even. I see it almost every morning when I walk my dog, and it's not, it's not good. Uh, this is why we are the target during drought restrictions. Um, these types of systems make the irrigation industry look bad. So pressure regulation can help us improve our image. And in some states, uh, pressure regulation is already becoming mandatory. So far, we have five states that are moving forward with pressure regulation mandates for spray pop-ups. EPA WaterSense created a standard for certifying pressure regulated spray sprinklers based on performance. And the standard has been readily adopted by many states and other agencies. Only EPA WaterSense certified pop-ups can be sold in the state of Vermont after July 1st. In California, pop-ups manufactured on or after October 1st have to be EPA WaterSense certified to be sold in the state. Colorado and Hawaii will only allow the sale of EPA WaterSense certified pop-ups starting in January, and Washington will require products date coded on or after January 1st to be EPA WaterSense certified. So how do we know which ones are certified? Uh, Hunter Pro Spray PRS models are all EPA WaterSense certified, and they're listed on the EPA WaterSense website, which is great. The Pro Spray PRS boxes are all labeled with the EPA WaterSense logo, and the web page for each model also shows that product certification. For states with the manufactured on or after date code requirements, the product date code on Pro Sprays can be found on top of the cap. These are shown as quarter year, so just be aware of that. So October would be the start of the fourth quarter. Any Pro Spray sold with a date code of 420 is for the fourth quarter 2020 in the state of California will be required to be EPA WaterSense certified. A date code of 121 for the first quarter of 2021 in Washington will require EPA WaterSense certification. We also have color-coded caps for easy identification, so that should be pretty helpful. The standard model has a black cap, and the pressure regulated models come in either brown or gray caps depending on the pressure setting. So the brown cap designates the PRS 30 for 30 PSI regulation, and the gray cap designates the Pro Spray PRS 40 for 40 PSI regulation. Uh, reclaimed water models are also available with a purple cap and a big PRS 30 or PRS 40 will be molded into the top. So another benefit to the Pro Spray is that the bodies are the same for both standard and pressure regulated models. If you need to upgrade a site to pressure regulation, you can pull out the internals of a standard Pro Spray and drop in the new PRS version. So that's pretty handy. Uh, the co-molded wiper seal is the same, the cap design is the same, so it makes for easy replacements and upgrades. Julie, did you have anything else to add about uh, the color coding being a benefit on the spec side? Uh, yeah, I, I like to speak to my specifiers about this all the time because um, it's very important when you're doing construction observation that you're looking at the product from the ground. Um, so many times, you know, not installed but specified, and it's critical because of the water savings. So the Hunter product, having the color codes, having it printed on top, make sure you're looking for that when you're doing your construction observation. Great. Also, next is our overhead irrigation system. Um, if the pressures are 10 um, PSI or higher, um, they recommend the pressure to use the regulator to optimize the pressure pressure of the system. So for those states that are not required to regulate at the spray heads, if a zone is relatively small in number of heads, the distance covered, um, regulating at the valve is acceptable and less costly. But if the zones are large with several heads, in order to best balance the performance of each, each nozzle, 
each hedge be regulated? There's another way to answer to this question, though. So this is what we call a, a two-step process. So with the two-step process, um, some of the overhead systems are regulated at the valve and again at the head. So you can also go, um, the entire zone is then protected um, from high pressures and potential spikes at the same time. Each nozzle sees the same amount of pressure for maximum performance efficiency. We have seen two-step regulations at valves and heads, mainline and valves, and mainline and heads. So let's walk through a couple of examples. Okay, so the first example here, if the, in, if the incoming street pressure is really high, like 125, we would definitely need to regulate at the main line to about 80 PSI. From there, we could step down the pressure again at the valve to 50 PSI, or we could regulate at each head. Um, this practice is pretty common, uh, especially when pressures are really high to begin with. Pressure regulation will protect the equipment downstream from surges in general, in, or general wear and tear from high pressures. Having the two-step regulation method protects the equipment and improves the water efficiency of the system it is definitely not a requirement, but it can be good practice. So we're, a lot of folks will ask me this question, you know, when would I want to use both? Does that make sense? Um, and, and again, as I said, um, I see this more on large projects. So for instance, say a high school campus or university campus where there's lots of different products being used. So if you have Say we're pumping out of a, a lake and we have to have, you know, we've done our hydraulic calculations, we know that we need to have, say, 110 PSI at the point of connection in order to get the sports turf heads on the football field that may require 65 PSI to 70 to get those heads to, to pop up and be at the most efficient. So if we have spray zones along the way, um, obviously those spray zones are going to be um, working at their, their high efficiency at 110 or even at 90 PSI. So that's a perfect example. We're going to need some step down. Um, we wouldn't be able to pressure regulate at the point of connection because we need that 110 to get to our worst case. But we can start stepping down at, at, the, um, at the valve of the spray zones. And then if it's a large spray zone, we'd want to regulate um, in, within the head as well so that we have a balanced system. Now, the same would go for a, a, a three-quarter inch rotor zone. So that's an example of where you want to use both um, pressure regulation at the valve as well as in the head. Thank you. That's a really good example. Thank you for sharing. And um, sure. that's really the general idea behind pressure regulation. There are several ways to regulate the pressure of an irrigation system. And for each method used, you need to reference the product specs in order to understand the pressure differential needed. Uh, and for drip zone kits, the flow rate to dynamic pressure needed. Pressure regulation is becoming more and more important in our industry, not only to protect the longevity of an irrigation system, uh, but also to maximize the water savings. And with new rules coming around pressure regulation in several states and as well as local water districts, we need to become more comfortable using pressure regulators. And that is the presentation. So are there any questions we can go over? There are some questions that we can go over. The first question I have is, this one's kind of specific to Chris, what we talked about earlier with pressure regulation on the inlet side and the downstream side of a drip zone, at what pressure on the inlet side would you consider omitting a pressure regulator? And I think that's going to kind of depend on what your downstream desired regulation is. So do you want to touch on that? Sure. So what I look at is what is the emission device and what does the manufacturer's catalog say? So what I'm looking for to determine if I need a pressure regulator is the manufacturer's catalog. So if, a, let's say Hunter drip line, HDL tubing is rated to 50 PSI, so it's between uh, 12 and 50 PSI, let's say, I know I need at least, well, let's call it 20 PSI just to be safe to my worst case emitter. So if I know that I have at least uh, 20 PSI or 15 PSI to that emitter, I think I'm okay. But if something fluctuates or dips, I might want to have a little bit more. So that the answer is, if I'm under 50 at my uh, valve, I'm probably okay. But if I'm a little nervous, I might want to put in a, uh, if I have anything more than 50, I might want to put in a regulator. And again, there's a variety of regulators on page 153 of the catalog. 
uh, that you can choose from. And if you don't need a regulator, you can look at page 152 and simply pick a Y strainer, which is a, a good solution. So you don't have to put in a booster pump to make your drip zone kit work. Because who would want to do that, right? <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. So if you don't have a copy of the newest catalog, you can get it online uh, under professional resources at hunterindustries.com. So another question is, as a rule, and we kind of covered this what, with what the optimal operating pressures are of the sprinklers, but as a rule, what is high pressure or too much pressure at the valve? That's going to depend on what products you're running. If you're starting to see pressures that 50 PSI or above, like Chris was saying, at that point, I'd start using pressure regulation. I don't know, Fair Julie, enough. do you have anything else to add? Or yeah, yeah, exactly. So it really comes down to the design of the project um, and what components you're using on each zone. So at the valve, again, with your sprays, the standard spray, 30 PSI. If the, you're using MP rotators, then you're at the 40. Um, an intermediate rotor, you're going to be at 45. Uh, then you go, you, as you step up into the large scale rotors, you may need 60 or 70. Again, you would look at in your catalog, you're going to look at the, the charts of the project or the product and see what the optimal pressure um, is recommended for that product. So every, every design is going to be different, but the, the products um, are consistent in regards to, you know, what they work best at on, on what pressure. Yeah, and to Julie's point, when you're designing a system, sometimes you don't know you need pressure regulation until you've done your critical demand on your system and get to that worst case head and find out, ah, maybe I don't need pressure regulation in this zone, but over here at this zone, like again, the, the booster pump with the sports field, that parking lot irrigation small zone might need a regulator, whereas my large turf zone I'm just struggling to get the pressure I need to run those big rotors. And so sometimes you need pressure regulation on some zones and not others. And that's where mechanical versus hydraulic pressure regulation comes in. The AccuSync is a great tool to kind of to fill that gap in between and, and reduce a lot of that wear and tear on your system uh, with the smaller right. zones. And it's, and it's also important is your spray zones, the larger your spray zones are. Again, you want to balance them when you're designing, you know, like an H pattern. You don't want to infeed the spray zone. But the larger the spray zone, the more you, you are going to want to have pressure regulation to balance. So each head is going to get that optimum pressure. That kind of tees up yeah, this next question, too. That Those are some great insights. Uh, do you recommend using pressure regulation at both the valves and the heads? And again, it goes back to that last example. So if it's a large commercial site and your worst case scenario requires, um, you know, 70 PSI for, say, a sports turf rotor, then um, you may need to use um, both. And so, again, it goes back to, you know, bringing down that pressure. If you had 100 PSI in the spray zone, um, it's the pressure regulator in the spray head is, is going to best perform um, to bring that pressure down, probably from about 70 psi down. So you're you're going to you know want to re regulate at the valve, but then if it's a large spray zone, you're going to want to regulate all the spray heads as well to balance the system. Yeah, Greg. Another thing to point out too, that if I may, is when we're working on systems, we might be working on systems at 2 p.m. in the afternoon when a pressure is one thing, and then the irrigation system comes on at 2 a.m in the middle of the uh in the middle of the night when most of us are sleeping and the pressure on the infrastructure could be completely different particularly if we're running from a large municipal pump system and things like that so pressures will fluctuate in the line it's not always going to be the consistent all the way through so having that initial valve regulator to be able to respond to whatever's incoming is a nice thing to have because there could be a lot of wear and tear and water hammer if you're the only system running on a reclaimed you know main line you could have significant, you know, water hammer uh, on your system. And so having protection for your laterals and your, your main line overall is a good thing to have in addition to the efficiencies that head regulation provides. That's a great point, Chris. I know here in Florida we have a lot of reclaimed, and we've done some testing and, and have seen the pressure all over the place from time of day to day of the week. 
play can change. And then also on, say, the new construction site, or again, there's a lot of open land around it, and as that land gets developed, the pressure is going to change as well. So, you know, again, that, that's a very good point, that, that pressure, you know, just having a safeguard on your system, um, especially for reclaims, is really important. Fantastic. Talking about the pressure regulation, regu regulations or mandates that are coming, uh, some people are concerned if there's language that they should know about or some specifications required for it. Is there somewhere you could recommend going, Kelsey, that they could get more information on what's to come? Well, each state has their uh, bills, basically, uh, that explain exactly what's going on. But there, the language isn't really more than the product has to eat, meet EPA water sense standards by a certain date. That's and and that's the selling. Um, the only one that has a standard, the only state that has a standard as far as beyond distribution goes, is Hawaii. And Hawaii says that you actually can't. You have another year before you uh, can no longer install non-pressure regulated heads. So for the most part, it's product on the shelves by those dates has to have EPA water sense certification. There's two states that say the product have a manufacturing date code on or after a certain date. And so that allows distribution at least to sell through inventory. So there could be some older heads on the shelves. And as long as they're date coded before October 2020 uh, in the state of California, they can still be our standard pro sprays, let's say. Um, but after a product purchased after October is going to have to have that pressure regulation. Um, and as far as that any really language goes, we could, we're going to be putting out flyers that does provide the specific language to each of the states, uh, but it's not very specific in general. It's just that must meet EPA water sense certification in order to be sold by these dates. Go ahead, Julie. I, like, well, I, just wanted, I just wanted to add that as we are seeing more states that are mandating, but uh, also you need to check um, as I'm sure you do when you're doing your, your irrigation plans with the uh, local codes, because there could be a, a county code or a city code or a water management code regulation. I see that quite often. Um, here in Florida, we have a water star program, and, and that requires pressure regulation if you want to get that certification, or if you want to get lead certification or something like that, you would need to use pressure regulation. So, again, it's uh, every project, um, always check with your local code. Um, or if you're doing something special like lead, um, check with that as well. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Julie. California, yeah. since 2015, has required pressure regulation on new construction over uh, certain square footages. And uh, that's requiring pressure regulation to meet the optimal uh, manufacturer specified pressure. So it doesn't, it just says that your site needed to have that. And so now we're, it's kind of taking it a step further by requiring regulation at the head, this is going to affect maintenance professionals and people going in to replace sprinklers as well. So that's it's important to know that California's kind of been there for a while on new construction, but now with maintenance, it, it's something to consider. And that's the purpose of it, is it's targeting those older systems. It's not really the new systems going in. I mean, in general, new designs are designed around the optimal pressure for the products that are being used. It's the older systems that have been installed for several years. Those are the ones that have the higher pressure. They don't have pressure regulation. They're on little two inch pops uh, with six inch grass. So uh, this is what that's designed to target. Okay. Yeah, that brings up a good point that on uh, existing systems, it, it's uh, pretty simple to just put on the regulator on the, on the valve um, to regulate that that uh, pressure so you don't have to replace every head i mean you can but um if you're in a tight budget you can just regulate at the valve and that's definitely going to help mm -hmm. okay i think that that whole conversation there kind of answered a couple of other questions that popped up so if you do have any other questions outside of uh the conversation that we're having now feel free to email us another question here is Chris, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. You kind of touched on it. Do you have any insights on the lifespan of a regulator or any ways that you can spot a failed one or one that's kind of worn out over time? 
Um, I think that question might be better for Kelsey. I, she's the product manager for, for uh, Spray. So uh, Kelsey, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, in our testing, we, we test our product at Hunter for at least 10 years. So more than double the, the warranty. And in that testing, we can see that regulators may um, change slightly, but not necessarily stop regulating. Uh, what ends up happening is that spring inside the regulator just gets exercised more. And in the EPA testing standards, there is a requirement to exercise the spring several times before you actually start running the test. So we wanna make sure that that spring's had some movement to it and is a little bit more flexible than it was uh, when it first goes in the spray body. But in general, uh, as far as any, what a failure would look like, I would, I would actually like to see what if, I don't know what that failure means. Kelsey, can you go to the slide with the, with the pressure regulated head on there? Uh, and I just sure. trying to remember what slide it is. I don't have that in front of me, but uh, one of the one of the things with the pressure regulated stem in a in a pop up sprinkler is there are O rings inside and you know over time I suppose O rings could wear out potentially uh, but the 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 makeup of the uh, of the Hunter pressure regulator if you if you can uh, point down Kelsey to the little red uh, looks like an hourglass there yeah uh, mm -hmm. the the bottom of the pressure regulator doesn't move that's fixed. Okay, so the, the flow throttle is the red piece right there. And that doesn't move, but the top part does, or, I mean, it, the, that, that uh, O-ring's fixed. The top O-ring actually moves and glides yeah. up and down as the spring goes up and down. So if dirt were to get caught in there, I suppose it would be possible for a, a regulator to fail. However, Hunter does have technology that's unique to our partic particular pressure regulator on the top of that flow throttle to prevent debris from getting down there. So it does keep it very clean and allows that de debris to kind of flush out within cycles. So it, it wouldn't get caught up and, and prevent that spring from, from functioning. So it may be different by manufacturer. Uh, I, I suppose anything can happen with a mechanical product, but you know, it, it is one of those things that uh, I, I, I'm talking to other uh, product managers at Hunter that they had looked at in the early designs of the spray head. Hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. Now, I, one thing I wanted to mention to that too is if you want to know if your regulator is still working on your drip zone kit, you can, at the end of the line where your flush valve would be, you can put in a pressure gauge to see what the pressure is at the end of the line. If you have really high pressure, you know maybe it's starting to wear out. Um, it's also good to check that too when you are designing a system if you're doing a pressure regulation on sprays, you can use a spray. Greg, oh can I God. can I can I butt in while you're while you're getting blown up on text messages? <laughs> uh, hey, uh, so anyway, one of the things is to Greg mentioned is everybody always asks how do you figure out what the pressure is and how do you audit a drip system? And pressure is one of the number one ways you can audit a drip system. We didn't really talk about that as much, but if you look at the micro irrigation slide, usually at the end of your system is where you need to make sure you have that 10 pounds of pressure to run that emitter or 12 PSI, depending on the manufacturer's tubing. Uh, and so the eco indicator, which is essentially a pop-up spray, uh, has a pressure regulated, a pressure um, calibrated spring in the actual, the pop-up sprinkler. So it will only pop up if there's enough pressure at 12 PSI to actually run the irrigation at that point in the system. So it's a nice way, it's not shown here, but the eco indicator is a great tool to put in your system because you can put a gauge on that pop-up and see what your pressure is at that point in the system. So when you have a new turnover of construction, you can test your pressure at that point. And if the, the pressure at the valve is the same, if you see pressure go down, you can probably deduce that you have, you've got some leaks or, you know, uh, uh, cuts in the system that might be drawing down pressure. And if the pressure goes up, then maybe you've got some plugged emitters. So things that you can do with pressure and, and that eco indicator is a great tool. More to come. <laughs> Fixed our issue there. <laughs> um, Carlos had a, a good point. He mentioned that the pressure regulator, when you're doing a full system regulator, 
in Texas, they can't have anything between the meter and the backflow device. In my experience with pressure regulation at the point of connection, you normally have it downstream of the backflow preventer. The only thing that I normally see on the inlet side of the backflow preventer is sometimes a Y strainer to catch any debris from getting into the mechanism that could cause the the back siphon is, or the uh, the springs inside of there to fault. You guys have anything to add on that? Nope, I typically see it on the back side of the backflow after the backflow. Okay, and uh, a lot of questions came in about what kind of pressure you need on the inlet side going down the downstream side to make it work. And you guys have already addressed that. I just want to make sure that um, we direct them to the correct charts. And Chris, you mentioned the page numbers on the charts. Can you mention that one more time? Okay. Which I think I'm sharing yeah. the screen. So page 149 is where the ICZ drip zone kit is. And if you can see my uh, screen, you'll see the chart right there. See that? So it's it's we've moved it to the actual section where the drip zone kits are. In previous catalogs, it was in the back of the catalog. The charts were in the back of the catalog. But again, typically, just think it was a good rule of thumb. You need about 10 pounds higher coming into your device than you're trying to get your device to regulate to. So if you don't have 10 pounds higher, the question is, did you need a regulator in the first place? And chances are probably not. So, you know, just because California says you have to have a pressure that meets the manufacturer's spec, you might actually have that just on your design you know capacity and what your what your hydraulics give you so take a look at what you've got before you put a regulator on your system and then choose the regulator appropriately fantastic we have one more question i'm going to end with in this regard is back to those mandates and the question is if you already have a pre-existing systems are you going to have to retrofit for future installation on that area do you need to go back and install epa water sense heads if you're going to do an upgrade or a retrofit on a system that's already existing anytime you have to buy new pop-ups the only ones available on the shelves are supposed to be pressure regulated so there's no requirement that you'll have to go back and redo an entire system because it's not pressure regulated but moving forward if you are doing any retrofits, then it, the only options available to you are supposed to be pressure regulated heads. Okay, so if you're expanding on uh, an existing system, they won't require you to go back to anything else that was previously installed in that system and, and put in pressure no. regulated heads. Okay, no, good. No, they're making it very prescriptive. So it's just, it's, uh, it's like shower heads in California. The only ones that you can buy even um, both down, you know, from a professional contractor down to retail is uh, limited to a certain amount of gallons per minute. And it's just a prescriptive way of targeting everybody to reduce flow. So it's only moving forward. Well, we've reached pretty much our limit here on time. And I think we answered all the questions. If we didn't answer your question, please reach out to us. And do you guys have any final closing remarks? We'd love your feedback, so please, yeah, please send thank it. you. <laughs> and if you've got ideas for future webinars and things that you'd like Hunter to bring to you, please uh, please reach out. While I close it out, Kelsey, will you throw that intro slide back up on who we are and how they can contact each of us? Of course. Thank you very much. And lastly, a couple couple comments came in about doing the quiz based on the webinar, that will be posted on the training website. So that's training.hunterindustries.com. Visit there and there's a webinar link at the top that'll take you to the webinars that we've recorded. And inside of there, when it's posted, you'll see a quiz and you can take the quiz and get a certificate for that. So visit training.hunterindustries.com, check that out. And lastly, don't forget to describe, subscribe to the YouTube channel and check out our Rev It Up campaign. Thank you guys so much for the awesome presentation today. It was very, very well scripted and very well done. And from the bottom of our hearts here at Hunter Industries and from the entire Hunter family, we thank you so much for stopping by, supporting our business and keeping it going. Stay healthy and stay safe out there. Thank you very much.